Section 7.1 is inverse trig functions. So back in chapter 5, we introduced this idea of inverse functions. So you have a function and its inverse, which we denote with this f to the negative 1 right here. If you take the composite either direction, either f inverse composed with f or f composed with f inverse, then you end up with x for all x's in the domain of the outside function, or excuse me, the inside function. So just like other functions, trig functions do have inverses. And so we're going to talk about the inverses of trig functions. For f to have an inverse, then it has to be a one-to-one -one function, which means it has to pass the horizontal line test. So down here we have the graph of sine, and if I draw a horizontal line anywhere here, currently, because sine repeats the same pattern over and over again, it will not pass the horizontal line test. So sine is not currently a one-to-one -one function. So in order to make it a one-to-one -one function, we need to restrict the domain. Even if we just say between 0 and 2 pi, so our typical period of sine, even then it still would not pass the vertical line test. So in order to make sine 1 to 1, we restrict its domain from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. So now we're only looking at this section of the sine function in here. The reason we choose this section is because it hits every single y coordinate in the range of sine, which is negative 1 to 1. If we were to choose, for instance, uh, 0 to pi, it wouldn't be 1 to 1. It wouldn't pass the horizontal line test, and you would miss the negatives. So we restrict it as the fourth quadrant, negative pi over 2 to 0, and the first quadrant, 0 to pi over 2. Now our function is 1 to 1, and we can have an inverse function from it. So we have our inverse trig function, our inverse sine of x, so y equals sine inverse of x is how we say it, which solves the problem of if you switch your x and y's, you get y equals sine inverse of x, which means you're solving for the angle that gives you this sine value. So in a regular trig function, you plug in an angle and you get out a ratio. In an inverse, you plug in a ratio and you get out an angle. So domain and range of inverse trig functions, remember from inverse functions, if you have a domain of a regular function, it becomes your range of your inverse function. If you have a range of an original function, it becomes your domain of your inverse function. So the domain of an inverse trig function, what you can plug into an inverse sine of x, excuse me, just sine of x, is negative 1 to 1 because that was the range of the original function. That's what your ratios are. And then the range of the inverse sine of x is negative pi over 2 to pi over 2 because that's what we restricted the domain of the original sine of x. So your angles, the values you will get out of inverse sine are either angles in the first quadrant or the fourth quadrant. However, angles in the fourth quadrant, we list them by their negative angle instead of their positive large angle. So some examples, um, sine inverse of 1. So basically what that says is sine inverse of 1 is equal to some angle, and we want to solve for that angle. So it's basically asking the question, sine of what angle equals 1? So there are an infinite number of answers to this problem right here, but because we're talking about inverses, we've restricted the range as negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, so the only answer in that range is the angle pi over 2. So you're solving for the angle that gives you this ratio. So go ahead and try sine inverse of negative 1 half and sine inverse of 0. Remember, when you are... In the fourth quadrant, you're using negative angles. So if we look at the second one, sine inverse of negative 1 half is equal to what angle theta? So basically, sine of what angle equals negative 1 half? Again, there's an infinite number of answers to this equation, but because we're talking about inverse functions, we have a restricted range, which means the only possible answer is negative pi over 6. A lot of you may have answered 11 pi over 6, and that is the angle in the fourth quadrant, but because of our restricted range, we don't answer it 11 pi over 6, we answer it negative pi over 6. So same location, different angle. For the last one, sine inverse of 0 is equal to theta. I add that on the end so we can, if you want to switch this, the sine of what angle is equal to 0, and that angle is 0. So sometimes you'll see problems like these down here where you're taking one, either the inverse of a regular function of an angle or 
the regular function of an inverse of a ratio and solving for it. So when you do these, you want to do it step by step, inside first, order of operations. So the sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2. And then you want to solve this problem like you had above. So go ahead and pause the video and find the sine inverse of root 2 over 2. So you should end up back with pi over 4. Sine inverse of a positive root 2 over 2, that's what angle, sine of what angle equals root 2 over 2. That's first quadrant, so pi over 4. So go ahead and pause the video and try this second one. Sine inverse of the sine of 2 pi over 3. So sine of 2 pi over 3 is root 3 over 2. And then sine inverse of root 3 over 2, because of our restricted range, is pi over 3. So what you'll notice is this first one, you ended up with the same thing, same answer as what was inside, versus this second one, you didn't. The way that you can tell is whether or not this angle matches the range of an inverse. If it does match, like this first one, you can just cancel them off and you end up with whatever's inside. For the second one, if it doesn't match, then you have to figure out what angle would give you that same trig ratio but is in the correct range, is in the correct quadrants one and four. Going the opposite direction, I want you to plug these two into your calculator and see what you get. Sine inverse on a calculator is second sine. So you type sine and then second sine and 0.8. Make sure your calculator is in radian mode. So for the first one, you should end up with 0.8. And the second one, if you notice, you plug it in, you get a domain error. So remember, we also restricted, because of our restricted range of sign, we have a restricted domain of an inverse trig function. So if whatever you plug in, what if, if whatever this ratio is, is between negative 1 and 1, just like the example above, they'll end up ca crossing out and you just get whatever's inside. However, if you have something that is outside the domain, then it's not possible. You can't do this because 1.8 is not in the domain of sine inverse. Here are some notes on cosine inverse and tangent inverse. I would pause the video and write these down. So what you'll notice is for cosine inverse, we have a restricted domain because of the restricted range of cosine. Cosine only goes between negative 1 and 1. So therefore, the domain of cosine only goes between negative 1 and 1, similar to sine. With the range, the way that we limit the domain of cosine in order to create a inverse trig function is we limit it from 0 to pi. So instead of sine was negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, the range for cosine is 0 to pi. So you only get angles in the first and second quadrants. For tangent, the range of tangent is all real numbers, so the domain of tangent inverse is all real numbers. You can plug anything into tangent inverse. For the range of tangent inverse, you will only get angles between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So very similar to sine, the only difference is pi over 2 and negative pi over 2 are not included because they are not in the domain of tangent of x. So again, the angles are only in the first and fourth quadrants, and when you're in the fourth quadrants, you answer the negative angle instead of the big positive angle. So this is a shortcut for remembering which inverse trig functions ranges lie in which quadrant. So we say sideways L. So if we have this sideways L here, these three lie in quadrants one and two, so cosine, secant, and cotangent inverses. And then the other three outside of sideways L lie in quadrants one and four. So I kind of think of it as if it's cosine strong, cosine 1 over cosine, cosine over sine. If it's cosine strong, it lives in quadrants 1 and 2. If it's sine strong, it lives in quadrants 1 and 4. Just a reminder, all angles in quadrant 4 are listed as small negatives, not their big positives. So here's some examples using cosine inverse and tangent inverse, similar to the ones we did with sine. So go ahead and pause the video and evaluate these inverse trig functions. So here's the answers. Cosine of what angle equals 0? So that would be pi over 2. Cosine of what angle equals negative root 2 over 2? Keeping in mind our restricted range, it must be in one of either the first or the second quadrant. So that would be 3 pi over 4.
tangent of what angle equals one, that means your x and y are the same coordinate and both positive or both negative. In this case, because we have to be in quadrant one, it would be pi over four. And then the last one, you have tangent inverse of negative root three. So tangent of what angle equals negative root three? Well, if you make that look like what you'd see on the unit circle, that would be negative root three over two over one half. So that would be fourth quadrant because negative, knowing the range of tangent, and root three over two for your y and one half for your x. So you end up with this coordinate. So that means you have negative pi over three. So here's some examples with the double trig functions, either a inverse of a original or an original of an inverse trig function. So again, pause the video, use what we did with the sine function similar to this to evaluate these three functions. So for this last one, you have cosine inverse of cosine of pi over 12. Pi over 12 is in the range of cosine inverse. It's in quadrant one. So these two are going to end up just canceling each other off, and you end up with just pi over 12. For the next one, again, negative one-half is in the domain of tangent inverse because the domain of tangent inverse is all real numbers. So your tangent and your tangent inverse are going to end up canceling each other out, and you're just going to get negative one-half back. The last one, 2 pi over 3 is not in the range of tangent. It's in the second quadrant, and tangent inverse is only in quadrants 1 and 4. So if you actually evaluate this, you end up with negative root 3 over 2 over 1 half. And then the tangent inverse, you want to find an angle in the correct quadrants that gives you that same ratio. So it would be negative pi over 3 down in the fourth quadrant. So this is the introduction to inverse trig functions. The most important thing is to keep in mind the restricted domains and ranges of these functions.